We'll call to order tonight's Committee of the Whole for the Auburn City Council meeting for February the 20th, 2024. The City Council should have the minutes from the Committee of the Whole from February the 6th. Are there any additions or corrections to those minutes? If not, is there a move to approve? So moved. Second. I have a motion to second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And the minutes are carried forth. Cemetery Advisory Board, Mayor Pro Tem Whitten. Yes, sir. We have one vacancy. Term begins immediately and ends February 4, 2028. Um, incumbent Jerry Smith has served two full terms. I would like to nominate Robert Crumpton for that um, vacancy. Second. I have a motion and a second for Robert Crumpton. Any discussion? Comments? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And we will confirm that later on in the agenda. Questions on tonight's agenda for the city manager? Any questions? All right, Ms. Crouch, anything for us? No, sir. Okay. Is there a move to adjourn? So moved. All right. We are adjourned, and for our audience, we will get started right at 6 o'clock. We'll call to order tonight's Auburn City Council meeting for February the 20th, 2024. Certainly welcome to everybody that's joined us live here tonight. We 
Thank all of you who might be listening on WANI, as well as watching through our streaming services. Welcome to our meeting. Lindsay, with a roll call. Adams. Koblenz. Here. Dawson. Here. Griswold. Here. Norman. Here. Parsons. Here. Taylor. Here. 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 Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Earlier tonight, during the Committee of the Whole, the City Council appointed Robert Crumpton to the Cemetery Advisory Board, and we certainly again want to thank Mr. Jerry Smith, who served two full terms. Under Mayor's announcement tonight, I want to uh, welcome members of the Auburn High School FFA that have joined us this evening. We're glad to have you guys and look forward to hearing from you a little bit later on in our agenda. I want to say thank you to everybody that participated in helping and putting on and working the War Eagle Run that occurred this past Sunday. There was almost 4,000 people who participated in that run. I believe a lot of those people came from out of town and spent a little money with us uh, as they got their exercise on, and we appreciate uh, the organization. Certainly Public Safety um, did a lot of work to maintain our roads on a Sunday morning where people were busy going to church and doing other things, but congratulations. Um, this past uh, yesterday, in fact, I attended the Presbyterian Community Ministries uh, annual meeting. Uh, certainly want to thank that organization again for all the hard work that they do to provide support for those in need in our community with home repairs and and uh, and helping to pay different kinds of bills around their houses. Uh, this ministry has been in our community for a long, long time. I believe it started in 1969, and so some very dedicated citizens are part of this, and they were having their annual meeting, and I appreciate the invite to be a part of that. Uh, last Saturday night, the Darden Foundation extended scholarships to five young people who are actually all going to universities uh, or colleges at Auburn. Uh, some are at VCOM, they're pharmacy students, nursing students, and uh, what a great celebration of the history and the legacy of uh, Mr. Dr. Darden, who was our first ever African-American uh, physician in Lee County, and certainly his legacy is continuing on with these young people who are getting opportunities to go to either pharmacy school, nursing school, or medical school through the support of the Darden Foundation. This coming Sunday night, I'll be attending the uh, annual banquet of the SGA's officers as they uh, say thank you to their present officers and they install their new officers. And I certainly look forward to that and continue to be uh, very bullish on the relationship between the student body and their leadership in this city and making things better for all of us who live here in Auburn. I want to say congratulations to the Auburn High girls basketball team who won a close game today in the Elite Eight. We'll be playing in the Final Four next week in Birmingham. We're very proud of those young ladies. Our boys almost won. Uh, they came up two points short. But congratulations to both of those teams. But we look forward to keeping up with the girls' team as they continue moving on. And I want to remind everyone, and I said this last time, before we meet again, we'll have had a primary. And um, many of you, a lot of you might have different, a different voting location than you are traditionally used to attending. You should have all received a little postcard in the mail. Please check on that before March the 5th, and that is also during spring break. So if you're going to be out, uh, please uh, fill out an absentee ballot. There is a uh, significant local election. You might have seen the yard signs or the signs around our community for a judge spot, but it is our primary, and it is your right and your uh, um your ability to go vote, and I encourage everybody to certainly do that. But try to find your note card that was sent to you from the county. Um, if you do not have that and you are looking for a some information on where you need to vote, Megan, I'm sure Mr. Dorton knows exactly where they need to go to find out. Well, really, uh, the Alabama Secretary of State website is the okay. best place to go for that. Alabama Secretary of State's website. So if you don't have your postcard and you're not sure where you're going to vote, please check on that. We've got a new city uh, building that we'll be utilizing on Wire Road, and there are four different churches in our community that will be hosting um, a polling area. So that is all for me. Anyone else on the council have anything they'd like to say tonight? Any announcements? Anyone? Mayor, if you may. Please. Chief, saddened this week to learn of the passing of Councilman Dick Phelan. Uh, I first was elected to the council. I served with Mr. Do Mr. Phelan, and uh, he was a constant gentleman, and, and I admired the way he carried himself. <clears throat> he was a true Auburn man. Uh, examples of him, the way he lived his life, 
and I uh, just can't say enough about how much he'll be missed. And, uh, uh, we, we've all, we're losing far too many men of that and women of that generation, and there's, there's something special to this country. He helped make this country what it is, and he helped make Auburn a better place. So I'm, I'm thankful to have served with him, and uh, I'm a better person for having known Councilman Dick Phelan. Thank you for saying that, Tommy, and I certainly should have mentioned something as well. Dick Phelan um, went to the Naval Academy. He was a Naval fighter pilot. He, he came to Auburn originally to be a part of the ROTC program, the Naval ROTC program, and what ended up with that move is a great citizen who served 16 years on this city council and served his community in a number of other ways through Rotary, uh, was, has been a big part of our Veterans Committee for all these years, and he and Edna have been great corporate citizens of our community, and they've done a lot for a lot of people and a lot of organizations, and Dick is a very, very special man, and we'll certainly miss him. Thank you, Chief, for helping remind me of that. Okay, anyone else? Okay, we'll move ahead with Auburn University Communications. Good afternoon, y'all. Good afternoon. The Auburn Dance Marathon ended Saturday. Participants stayed on their feet for over 10 hours, dancing to raise over $350,000 for the Children's Miracle Network. Um, it's a really great program they've got going there, uh, raising money for um, hospitals across, across the country. I'm really proud of our, our students participating in that. The Auburn University Student Lobby Board will be attending Higher Education Day at the Capitol in Montgomery this Thursday. Uh, higher education institutions across the state are meeting up to participate in this event. Uh, it'll include a brief parade around the Capitol, followed by a speech by the governor, uh, as well as a chance to meet with their assigned legislators as they advocate for expansions to the Higher Education Trust Fund, which is something that we find very important. This month is Black History Month, and as the Black Student Union is celebrating their 40th anniversary, they hosted a formal dinner with a couple really great guest speakers, as well as this year's Unity Week, which featured activities such as a networking hour, allowing members of the Black Student Union to speak and meet with other um, officials and, and people to help progress their careers going forward. Um, it had art exhibitions, um, a field day, painting activities, as well as a social hour with the International Student Organization. From what I hear, it went really well. Um, the fall application cycle for the 2024 admissions class is underway. And in the first batch of admitted students uh, through the early action process, the average ACT score was a 29. The average GPA was a 4.2, um, which is really impressive statistics. Um, overall, there were over 55,000 applications this year, which sets a new university record and is an increase in 14% from last fall. And finally, there is a new Obby statue coming in front of the Melton Student Center, that is going to be unveiled this Saturday, which is something we're all looking forward to. But that's all for me this week, War Eagle. War Eagle. Okay, this time is an opportunity for citizens to communicate to the City Council about anything on the agenda. Um, we'd ask that you come forward and give us your name and address for the record. You have five minutes. There are a number of items on our agenda uh, tonight, uh, particularly uh, under ordinances and resolutions that do have public hearings attached. And if you'd like to speak about one of those, I'd ask that you wait until that time to speak to the city council. But if you'd like to address us about anything else that's on the agenda, please come forward and give us your name and address for the record. Okay, seeing no one, we'll move ahead with city manager's communications. All right, under city manager's communications this evening, we have the announcement of quite a few board uh, vacancies. A lot of this is caused by us bumping our first March meeting later one week, so just bear with me for a minute. We have one vacancy on the Auburn Waterworks Board for a term that begins April 6th and ends April 5th, 2030. The appointment will be made at the March 19th City Council meeting, one vacancy on the Downtown Design Review Committee for a term that begins April 18th and ends April 17th, 2030. The, the appointment will be made at the April 2nd City Council meeting, two vacancies on the Historic Preservation Commission for terms that begin April 21st and end April 20th, 2027. The appointments will be made at the April 2nd City <coughs> Council meeting. One vacancy on the Auburn Public Library Board for a term that begins April 15th and ends April 14th, 2028. The appointment will be made at the April 2nd City Council meeting. One vacancy on the Cemetery Advisory Board for a term that begins April 15th and ends April 14th, 2028. The appointment will be made at the April 2nd City Council meeting. And last but not least, one vacancy on the Board of Education for a term that begins June 1st 
and ends May 30th, May 31st, 2030. The appointment will be made at the April 16th City Council meeting. All of the above vacancies will be posted tomorrow and the portal will open. Okay, thank you. Move forward with the consent agenda. All right, our first item of business is a consent agenda. Does any council member wish to remove an item from the consent agenda and deal with that item individually? Yes, Please. Mr. Mayor, thank Please. you. Yep. I'd like to remove items 8C, that's 8 Charlie, and 8 Echo E. C, 8 E, okay. Anyone else? Okay, we'll start with 8C. Item 8C authorizes revisions and updates the engineering design and construction manual. This item was postponed from the February 6th meeting. Move, Move for, for approval. approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. Mr. Griswold. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm, I mentioned this to the city manager earlier. Uh, the, uh, the change on page 1-36, which replaces the flow chart, is missing a couple of steps. And the steps are called out on page 1-30. Uh, no change to the text, no problem with the text. But I would ask that the flow chart be revised to um, account for the three possible actions that are detailed on page 130. Those being conditional approval, continuance, or denial. So that's, uh, again, I, I have no intention to withhold a vote on this, okay. but I would ask that the staff take a look at that prior to final publication. Ms. Crouch, is it, are we still okay to go ahead and move forward tonight with, with his Absolutely, we are. Ms. Griswold's suggestions the, the or The steps are request? outlined outline there that this addresses what one does but it doesn't specifically call out those three items so something we're happy to look at okay good all right thank you anyone else okay we got a motion second all in favor please say aye aye, aye. any opposed and the motion carries item 80 accepts maintenance of approximately 4.92 miles of streets previously maintained by lee county move for approval second I have a motion to second, Mr. Griswold. Again, thank you. Uh, I just have one question: uh, Are we going to be responsible for bringing these up to city standards, or is the county responsible for doing that prior to us accepting responsibility for them? It's a it's a hybrid of things through the MPO funds, but I'll have City Engineer Fraser speak to that. So typically, we just accept them as is, unless there's a special condition we need to work out with the county. Um, several years ago, we actually acquired several streets and received money from the county. But in this case, we would just receive the streets as they are. Uh, we are working with the county on the section of Beehive Road, but the other streets we'll just take as is. So why would we take on the responsibility for these if we have to put money into them before they're up to standard? So the process is that based on the annexations um, that occur over the years, typically we do it annually, but we haven't done it in a few years. As the city annexes property on both sides of each street, the city then begins to assume responsibility for those sections. So it's really a function of more so annexation than anything. And in this case, the city has, Ms. Crouch, virtually all the property on either side of the street here? We do, and it, and some of this is even involved in annexations and other things you have tonight. It's kind of a, a true up over time, but this is, this is a process we've followed for years. There have been times something's in really bad shape, we don't, but also to the point of the county when the city's fully encompass both sides of a section of road that's kind of um, their ability to maintain when it's really in the city limits they ask us to do this not all county roads that we've accepted over the years are ever up to city standards unless we do a full depth reclamation which you're about to see on beehive road we're going to have to weigh dig ups but the section of it that is the worst in some senses is not the section that we're going to be owning which is from West Tech Lane back toward the interstate and Old Cox Road, that that is in rough shape too, which we're working with them on, but that's not our road. Um, and so therefore we're taking a section that is wholly in the city limits. And that's something also based on all that's going on out there needs to be fixed and it will be. And then for Mrs. James Road, a, bit, a large portion of that um, will be redeveloped by the development that is going off of Mrs. James Road? Yes, the old Sanford development. Okay. Yes. And the county and I work to try to determine a logical terminus so that Mr. Ballard knows where those endpoints are versus, say, mid-block. So on Miss James Road, you see it does go to Quell Chase, and there's a portion that is just outside of the city, but the majority of that section is within the city limits. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we still have a lot of citizens that live, especially on the far reaches of the city, off of county roads and that the county maintains. So... Mr. Griswold, you, you complete? 
Yeah, nothing, oh. more to, nothing more to say. Okay. <laughs> Anyone else have a question or comment? I'm very pleased to see the beehive row change, but I, we really need it needs we need to work with the county or somebody or taking ourselves. Uh, beehive row really needs some improvements, particularly all the building going on in Industrial Park out there. Uh, the road all the way from Cox Road, what is now Cox Road, to, to uh, Wire Road. Really needs major improvements for all the traffic that's on it now. And we're working with the county on it, but right now what's mainly slated is West Tech Lane to Biltmore Lane, the section that we're, yeah. How's that? Not, just something we need to keep in mind for the we, future. Absolutely. We'll work at the staff level, and you guys can work at the political level with the county commissioners. Thank you. Okay. Any further questions or comments? All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. I have a motion to approve the balance of the consent agenda. So moved. Second. second. I have a motion to second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And the consent agenda is approved. Ordinances. Item 9A1 is a request from the Industrial Development Board of the City of Auburn to annex approximately 160 acres of property located at 9... Well, 94 or 94 Lee Road 9, also known as Biltmore Lane. Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this request at its January 11th meeting. Unanimous consent is necessary. I introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent. Second. I have a motion of seconds. Anyone on the council have a problem moving forward with the vote on this this evening? Okay. Hearing none, are there any comments or questions? Okay, hearing none. Lindsay with the roll call. Mormon? Yes, ma'am. Parsons? Yes. Taylor? Yes. Whitney? Yes. Koblenz? Yes, ma'am. Dawson? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Item 9A2 is a request from the City of Auburn to annex approximately 2.07 acres of property that houses the City of Auburn List Station located east of Biltmore Lane and north of Interstate 85. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this request at its February 8th meeting. Unanimous consent is necessary. I'll introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent. Second. I have a motion and a second. Does anyone on the council have a problem <coughs> moving forward to vote on this this evening? Seeing and hearing none of the questions or comments from the council. Okay. Lindsay with a roll call. Yes. Taylor? Yes. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Item 9A3 is a request from Catherine Barrett to annex approximately 2.9 acres of property located at 2220 Estate Drive. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this request at its February 8th meeting. Unanimous consent is necessary. I'll introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent. Second. A motion seconds. Anyone on the council have a problem moving forward with the vote on this this evening? Hearing none, any comments or questions? Okay, Lindsay. Taylor? Yes. Yes. Koblenz? Yes, ma'am. Dawson? Yes, ma'am. Griswold? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Parsons? Yes. Yes. Item 9B1 is a request from Matt Cobb on behalf of Fountain Gate Church to rezone approximately 11.27 acres from rural to limited development district for property located at 1415 Moores Mill Road. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this request at its January 11th meeting. Unanimous consent is necessary and a public hearing is required. I'll introduce the ordinance and ask for unanimous consent. Second. I have a motion to second. Does anyone on the council have a problem moving forward with a vote on this this evening? Seeing and hearing none, we'll open the public hearing. If you'd like to address the City Council, we ask that you please come forward and share your name and address for the record, and you'll have five minutes. Seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing. Any comments or questions from the council? Can we, um, go, ahead. go ahead. I was just going to ask, can we um, get an overview of the purpose of the request for rezoning since this has been a longstanding um, use on this Sure, site? I'll have our planning director, Mr. Waheed Cotton, handle that, please. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Matt, you can't, sorry, the applicant is raising his hand, but I just want to remind you can't speak unless council asks. Yep. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thank you. So, so the reason that they requested the rezoning is that in rural, the the floor area ratio is a lot more restrictive than it is in LDD, and essentially they're already buttoned up against what that limit would be in rural. And so they requested a rezone to LDD. That way, it would accommodate their current expansion that they're attempting, and then any future expansions that they want to do to accommodate their new sanctuary as for the church. And so, like I said, the current restrictions in rural are far too restrictive for their 
planned expansions, and LDD would allow them to pursue their future expansions for the church. And we confirmed that their intentions are for to remain a church, and it's just going to be expansion of the sanctuary. Okay, thank you. Thanks. The uh, the adjacent property owner had some issues or some concerns about the water runoff with the new facility. <coughs> we would be reviewing the water runoff plans and ensure we're not creating further issues on adjacent property owners with, with runoff from this property? Yes, upon submission of their engineering plans, we will. Okay. All right. I, I just I want to say this, too. I think this highlights a, a need for us to kind of revisit our, our zoning ordinances and rewrite our zoning ordinances. Here we are kind of putting an institutional use into a, what I consider probably more of a primary residential type zoning to make it fit and I understand the staff's recommendation and why we did that because this gave us the lowest density possible uh, if something were to happen here but I certainly hope as we continue to rework or hopefully rework our zoning ordinances with the uh, an institutional use will be considered and, and hopefully down the road uh, an institutional reason <coughs> will, be, will occur for this property I'd like I would like that to see that happen down, down the road this property be considered uh, for rezoning to more of an institutional use. We have this one. We had Grace Church a few weeks ago. I think those are two examples that just kind of highlight our need to revamp our zoning ordinances altogether. And I think this, you know, just something we need to really work on and focus on. So just want to put that out there on public record. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else have a comment? Yes, sir, Mr. Griswold. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, We've stated that the, reg, the main reason for rezoning this is because of the floor, ratio, floor area ratio. Is Are there any options for waiving that, or can the uh, Board of Zoning Adjustment uh, do something that would prevent us from having to go through this action and still allow the church to expand? So for the Board of Zoning Adjustment to do that, there has to be a hardship created on the land by the ordinance. In this case, it... Well, that's up to the Board of Zoning Adjustment from a the longest tenured planner at the city, which is me, that does not meet the test. That means the, the zone allows them to do many things. It just doesn't allow them to expand the sanctuary to the level in which they want to. So the only other choice is to rezone it. Um, and so to Councilman Koblenz's point, the way our zoning ordinance is written is a lot of zones, many uses can coexist together. And what neighbors don't know is with a lot of our zone, it could be a hundred different types of uses from different housing types to different commercial things to offices going next door. And if I understood him correctly, he's saying he'd like to see something a little more prescriptive at times mm -hmm. where citizens know this is the list of things that can go here and otherwise pretty much, and except for rare circumstances, it can't. Churches are unique because they're one of the few things that's allowed in a lot of our zones conditionally because a lot of older churches are in <coughs> residential areas. But um, to that end, the only other way to do this is the new planned unit development regulations that we're looking at, um, which may not allow a church. I haven't even gotten to that point, but <laughs> for other developments, some of that comes in negotiations or things like this, where you're doing a specific plan for a specific piece of property. Yep, that's, yep, that's correct. And so right now, it, it's not a hardship. What a hardship for a variance is you built a house in the 60s and we changed the setbacks and your house burned down and now you want to build it back and you can't even build back what you have. That is a hardship created on the land by the ordinance. The zoning ordinance changed and your house didn't and now it burned down and you can't even build back the same house you had because we changed the regulations. That's a hardship. Yeah, I would definitely agree with... Uh Max's concerns about this. We, the future land use plan, you know, has this as institutional, and it just doesn't seem like it uh, makes a lot of sense to change the zoning just to accommodate something that's already in the future land use plan. But because um, again, it opens up too many options for other things. Uh, I share your concerns with that, and that's why I, I want to know this is going to be reconsidered. Hopefully, this will be reconsidered for institutional use down the road. Another question that I, I would have is we, we, we recreated or we created an interstate commerce district within our existing zoning ordinances. Is, is, is there some, a way for us to consider an institutional zoning within what our current is a, as a short-term solution to something that we possibly be doing down the road? The challenge with the interstate com commerce zones is there are <coughs> interchanges, and this is not an interchange. But, I mean, we created that within our existing zoning ordinances within the last year, is there a way to look at creating an institutional zoning 
within our current system you, before we get to rewriting? Theoretically, we could. And the challenge with that is anything called institutional. Institutional is a broad category, but that typically, you know, it, it means churches, it means hospitals, city facilities, lots of different things. But it means if we made an institutional zone and we didn't put anything else with it, that's all that could go there. Okay. And so we've got to look at the full definition of the category. So... In 1984, when the zoning ordinance, the current zoning ordinance was adopted, the, the City Council and Planning Commission went through and wholesale rezoned the entire city. And so I think as we methodically revised the zoning ordinance, you know, like some planning commissioners will say to me, it's been 30 years or more 40 years, actually, since we've touched anything relative. We've modified some zones and so on. We have a very, very capable a uh, new planning director who has a lot on his plate, but he's got a very broad mind. He's extremely talented. We're getting through planned unit development district things, and then we intend to mo methodically go through the zoning ordinance and thin it out. Our citizens don't understand it very easily. There's developers in the room who, and engineers who do an excellent job with it, but it's complicated. Um, we need to simplify it, and my goal is both the design side and development side, plus our citizens could actually understand it and know what we might get or what we might be able to do. And so that's next up. I don't want to scare people that we're getting rid of neighborhood conservation or anything like that, but what we do need, and we acknowledge that, I think to jump in, though, and just create a zone relative to this would take a good bit of study and time because we want to make sure also we don't sell this property short in terms of, well, you can only put six or eight things there. I'm not sure that's that's our goal either. I think the concern right now is LDD allows residential, unfettered, and permitted by right. And when it says institutional, you're not expecting residential there, which I, <clears throat> I fully understand. It's something we're happy to look at. Um, and we can certainly brainstorm. And I don't know. Do you have anything else to add to that? No, just that. I mean, we've already identified some inconsistencies with the uh, future land use plan and what things are uh, listed as institutional, something that we need to address internally. And then also, I mean, creating the inter institutional zoning district has been something that is on the radar for us later this year. So we'll be getting there. And also, there's that acknowledgement as we go through and adopt <clears throat> the next future land use plan with a comp plan update that we have to move expeditiously on the zoning side to catch up because this is where we get caught if we don't change a bunch of things relative to the future land use plan, then you have these very questions. And we very want, much want you to be at the table and weigh in and get these things done as quickly as possible simultaneously. So the zoning matches the future land use plan. That would be the ultimate goal. <laughs> then it works like it should. But there's been no indication that the church wants, has any desire in the, and the now or in the Mr. future. And the Mr. Cobb is here, and he can speak to that. Please, Mr. Cobb. Thank you. We do need you to give us your name and address yeah. for the record. Matt Cobb, 1492 Montrose Road. I'm the engineer applicant of record. Um, right now, the church is having their their services in a gym. And right now, they're looking to build a sanctuary on the current, uh, everybody knows where it is, right? Mm -hmm. The current football field is sitting there. So they're building a sanctuary on the football field so they can house their their, their services. And that's just the gist of it. So nothing more, nothing less. Um, they're not looking to develop it anymore for residential or everything that LDD um, provides. They're just trying to get it somewhere where they can get out of their basketball gym into a sanctuary. So that's what we're looking at right now. So, Mr. Cobb, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked yes. um, Grace Church when their applicant was before us. <clears throat> at such time that an um, institutional use zone is created, could we come to you and ask you if you'd be willing to rezone at that time so that you're more fitting to the actual use um, that we may in time create? Say that one more time. So would you be willing to, <laughs> if, if at such you time... You see our zoning ordinance is complicated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, hey. If we create an institutional use zone um, that we're talking about and speaking about, at that time would, would your applicant be willing to to rezone to that so that it's more fitting to that zone and it would remove our doubt of anything else happening at that time with that property. I, mean, I can't speak for the client but if it happens within the construction time and the design time the drt process absolutely okay i mean and i've actually talked to the the landowners around about what we're doing and i think there was a question about you know detention those sort of things we've had those discussions and i've talked personally with them um, I mean, this may not be the, uh, the right place, but ponds and detention and those sort of things right now where there's actual runoff, 
we've already discussed those things with the current landowners that are adjacent to it. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we're all on board and all they're wanting to do is this. They're not trying to build townhomes or a strip center or commercial properties or anything like that. They're just trying to get a place where they can get out of their gym into a sanctuary. Right. Thank you. So, Thanks. And Mr. Mayor, if I may also, the, um, you know, we're always careful from a legal standpoint, but the council does have the right when we're doing universal and city initiated rezonings to rezone, especially when you're doing so to the future land use plan. It's been in place for some time. So you do have the ability to do your own map amendments within reason. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah, so sure. it's safe to say that if we don't just don't approve this, they can't build their sanctuary. Is that bottom line? From a floor area ratio standpoint, it will not. Yep, that is correct. They can't expand okay. anymore. All right. Thank <coughs> you. Yeah. Okay. Lindsay with a roll call. Witten. Yes. Oblance. Yes, ma'am. Dawson. Yes, ma'am. Griswold. Yes, ma'am. Mormon. Yes, ma'am. Parsons. Yes. <coughs> Taylor. Yes. Yes. Item 9B2 is a request from the Industrial Development Board of the City of Auburn to rezone approximately 160 acres from rural to industrial for property located at 94 Lee Road 9, also known as Biltmore Lane. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this request at its January 11th meeting. Unanimous consent is necessary and a public hearing is required. Land use ordinance and ask unanimous consent. Second. second. I have a motion and a second. Does anyone on the council have a problem moving forward with the vote on this this evening? Seeing a hearing none, I'll open the public hearing. If you'd like to address the city council, please come forward and give us your name and address for the record, and you'll have five minutes to speak. Good. Seeing no one, we'll close the public hearing. Any comments or questions for the council? From the council. Okay. Lindsay? Yes, ma'am. Dawson? Yes, ma'am. Griswold? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Parsons? Yes. <clears throat> yes. 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 Item 10A1 is a request from the Housing Authority of the City of Auburn for conditional use approval of an institutional use to redevelop 56 apartments for property located at 945 North Donahue Drive. Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this request at its February 8th meeting. A public hearing is required. Move for, for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. This time I'll open the public hearing. If you'd like to address City Council, please come forward and give us your name and address for the record. And you'll have five minutes. Brett Basquin with the Foresight Group, just here on behalf of the applicant, to let you know, happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll close the public hearing. Any comments or questions from the council? This just for clarity. I just, um, on this, this conditional use, this is nothing new, right? correct? This is something that's, over the years, it, this is the use they, they always have had, so this is nothing new. I just want to clarify that. That's correct. Correct. Yep. I was going to make a similar comment uh, uh, to that. Uh, this has been a going concern since 1971. And what we're voting on tonight is conditional use for the same use. So it's a little confusing, but no changes. And um, it, at least that's the way I see it. You can correct me if you need to, but with uh, a long serving, this kind of reminds you of the church uh, argument again, where you've got um, zoning requirements that have changed around the issue. And uh, we're just trying to clean that up with the zoning uh, request tonight. But we're doing that by way of conditional use approval. Correct. You would be in the same boat, and we don't want this to happen, and it did not happen, and I don't want it taken that way. But if some natural disaster destroyed half the units and hurt no people, um, they would still have to come back to you to rebuild because it's the nature of this redevelopment district, zoning district, which permeates throughout this whole area. But that is fully accurate. Nothing is changing here. You're taking out 56 units and you're putting back 56 new units. Uh, the main difference is that what appears to be the red brick style public housing that is repeated from coast to coast and north to south, east to west, goes away um, in this first phase and will continue to go away. And these will look like market rate apartments that we see populated throughout the city 
and will be a much better environment. But, um, you know, noted about your concerns relative to having to do a conditional use, but it's the nature of the zoning district and has been this way since 1984. Something else we, we can look at, but isn't uncommon. All right. Any other comments or questions? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yeah. Motion carries. Item 10A2 is a request from Brett Baskin on behalf of JL Ventures LLC for conditional use approval for two commercial uses, climate controlled self storage facility and warehouse for property located in the 600 block of West Veterans Boulevard um, on the south side of West Veterans Boulevard directly abutting Auburn Technology Park North. The Planning Commission unanimously recommended approval of this request at its February 8th meeting. A public hearing is required. Move for approval. approval. A motion in a second. At this time, we're we'll in the public hearing. If you'd like to address the City Council, please come forward and give us your name and address for the record. Seeing and hearing no one, we'll close the public hearing. Any comments or questions from the Council? Mr. Mayor, uh, please. Uh, this parcel, we come in on West Veterans, and it looks like some of this is, goes back towards the interstate, if I'm not mistaken. And, the facade on the outside of this building, I mean, it's kind of an entryway on 85. Will we be able to see the, that, that building from 85 coming in, or is it, uh, will it be shielded by tr existing trees that are on the park? This property there? is lower. Um, some of the site has been um, logged to this point and somewhat cleared. I don't know if staff has. from looking at it from West Veterans and not from 85, but um, from the corridor standpoint, uh, I guess kind of like, like we previously discussed at Planning Commission, the facade standards were waived uh, at the Planning Commission level. And then they also gave, Planning Commission also gave staff discretion to determine if that the facade standards would meet staff standards. And so I, I guess your, your concerns will, will be mitigated from, from a standpoint of that staff still has final say to accept the facades, the facade that they submit. Okay. But only the facade on the front building facing West Veterans yep, and what's, what's visible from West Veterans, not that from the interstate. Um, I have extreme familiarity with the, the property before it was developed, and it is it sits quite low down, and you would mainly see it as you're accelerating on I-85 going, going, going toward Montgomery, yeah, going south. And so um, you're probably paying attention to merging and other things. It will not be unattractive, but it doesn't have the same level of treatment requirements, and it is adjacent to our industrial buildings that, that have certain looks, but this would be a similar look. Okay. Right. Any other questions, comments? All right, I have a motion and second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And that motion carries. Item 10B authorizes a tax abatement for Lewa America Incorporated for the purchase of new manufacturing machinery to be located at 229 Enterprise Drive in Auburn Technology Park South. The company anticipates hiring 24 new employees over the next two years and investing approximately $5.37 million. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any comments or questions from the council? All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And the motion carries. Item 10C1 authorizes a contract with Bats and Cook Company for the Auburn Public Library ADA restroom re renovations project in the amount of $597,756. Move for, for approval. approval. I have a motion and a second. Any comments or questions from the council? Yes, sir. I have a kind of a uh, summary here. We've looked at this. Um, in theory, but now we're looking at it in detail. And these uh, appear to be family-friendly uh, constructed bathrooms. So I, I just want to point that out, that we've looked at it from that viewpoint. Uh, the only thing I think anybody's got a concern about uh, is that uh, the joint or communal or whatever the right word, uh, multi-gender washroom, but that doesn't appear to be an issue either with the, the doors open to the, to the public there and they're uh, easily accessible at any time. In fact, I don't even know if there are any doors. I don't believe there are on the there washroom are area. There are not doors, no doors. So it's kind of wide open there. So I don't see any cause for concern, no cause for alarm on this from uh, a family-friendly point of view here. And that really is the point is to make it 
as safe as possible for so we're, know, we're adding two families yeah. or, or whatnot whatever kind of scenario there's two family restrooms that are just open the door and go in and then this one is in the children's area and has five i call them toilet rooms floor to ceiling completely enclosed doors and then a common sink area that allows a parent with a child of of any gender to be in the bathroom area with their children and they can be in the in the bathroom room or stall with them or not but they can stand in the sink area all they want. You can see clearly in there. Um, yes, there's plenty of privacy, but it's very open, and this is a concept that, that addresses where parents can be in there with their children, no problem. Any other questions, comments? All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And the motion carries. Item 10C2 authorizes a contract with ProLogic ITS LLC for the purchase and installation of police vehicle equipment for 23 vehicles in the amount of $263,342.53. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion and second. Any comments or questions from the council? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And item 10C3 authorizes the use of various funding sources totaling $1.8 million to assist the Auburn Housing Authority with Ridgecrest Apartments Redevelopment Phase 1, which will redevelop 56 units with a total investment of $20.23 million. Move for approval. Second. I have a motion and a second. Any comments or questions from the council? I just would like to say I think this is a great step forward and um, and really bringing this area up to, to current standards and, and also um, provides a lot more um, of an aesthetic that is comparable to modern housing and I just think it's a good step forward and I appreciate the efforts. Thank you. I agree with Ms. Whitten on that. I think it's a great idea and uh, I think it'll help in the fight <clears throat> crime in the area uh, look much better and I'm just very, uh, I'm very happy to see the city of Auburn take this step. To and I, and I just want to say, I would like to thank Ms. Sharon Torbert for her vision to upgrade the appearance of the Housing Authority, and your strong dedication and efforts to make a difference in the community. Ms. Sharon and her staff have put together a great design that will enhance enhance the quality of life for all the residents living in the housing authority. Better and affordable housing will provide residents in a, in a safer and secure environment that, can, that they can feel proud to call home. Ms. Sharon, continue to push your platform to the highest level, and I'm sure it will prevail. Thanks again for all you do for your tenants and the constituents of Ward 1, 4, and 5, and the community. Keep striving. Good. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Excellent. Anyone else? Yes, sir, Mr. I'd, Warren. I'd like to second that. Very, very well said. Uh, this is going to be startlingly different. It's going to be quite different as to the standard that we're used to seeing. And I think if we're not leading the front here we're very close to it uh I, there may be one i think you mentioned in lagrange there's some similar you can see similar. in lagrange easily yes right. but uh we're going to be very proud of this change it's going to be dramatic and uh, our portion of this in the finance areas not very much frankly but um, it's very creative i think um, we, this is about our last 300000 in the COVID funds, so we're just finishing that off, and uh, the block grant. And in addition to that, there's a shared loan. So we're, we're only paying half of that back. So And some general fund money. <laughs> oh, that's right. that's right. For the Delta. But very right. well done. It, it's going to be something that we'll all stand back and say, wow, we're proud of that. Everybody else good? Yes, sir. And those of you that are just looking at the agenda item, when you see this $20 million expenditure, it looks like real, real sticker shock, and it's a huge number. But the city is not not carrying that entire load, and Ms. Talbert has done a fine job of reaching out and finding all other, um, other people's money to take care of this project. And if for some reason the other people's money falls through, then the city is not obligated to follow through either. Because it takes a certain amount of money to do this. If we can't get it all, then we can't do it. 
So again, Sharon has done a, a fantastic job and uh, don't want anybody to, to walk out of here thinking, oh my God, the city just spent $20 million for 56 units. That's not, not the case. Thank you, Mr. Griswold. Mr. Talbert, thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your board's leadership. Thank you for your continued vision for improving the lives of those that uh, you work with every day. We're grateful. We're also appreciative of your service on the Auburn City School Board in your spare time. And thank you for what you do there. I want to thank the staff. There was a number of, of staff members that came together to figure this out when the need was communicated to the city that our participation was vital. And, uh, and Megan, I'm grateful for all those people that work for you that came together and creatively thought of a way for us to uh, be the final piece of this. Uh, this, is, this is great for 56 families and 56 clients of, of Ms. Talbert and the Auburn Housing Authority, but it's also a great day for Auburn. Um, all of us should care deeply about those who need housing the most. And this is who this is serving. And it's a proud day for our community. There are thousands of cars that go up and down Donahue Drive every day. And this is going to be a bright, shining star on Donahue Drive for us to ride by. But there's going to be some happy children and some happy parents that live in these facilities that are going to be so proud of where they get to live now and, and where they're going to be raising their families and doing life. And um, it's very encouraging to know the changes that that could make in itself uh, for those families and those young people um, as they grow up and live here in Auburn. So this is, this is really important. It's really important, and, um, and I appreciate all the hard work for all the people. The council has worked hard on this. The staff has worked hard on this. The housing authorities worked hard on this, and, uh, and we wish all the best as we move forward. Yes, Ms. Darby, would you like to come say something? I, will, I think the council will be okay if you'd like to come say something to us, please. Yes, ma'am. My tennis shoes. I'm recovering from my ankle sprain, so <laughs> I I will. It, I'm going to try to say this without getting emotional, because <clears throat> you all feel that your investment is small considering the total amount of investment. But without the city council and the city of Auburn support, this will not happen. It's not just about the dollars. It's about the dollar that you're contributing that helps to a very competitive application process. So those dollars equates to points. Uh, we are grinding to get this application uh, submitted tomorrow. So I cannot thank you enough. I'm not one for calling names because I'm overlooked someone, but Megan McGowan, Philip Dunlap, you all have been here for me, Mayor, since I came from the city to the housing authority. So I can't thank you all enough that my intent to house family with dignity for people not to see projects, but people. So this is personal for me. I grew up in this neighborhood, although I'm no longer there. It's just my small part of trying to give back. So thank you all so much for helping us to provide families to live with decency and respect and help us to remove the stigma that's associated with people that's just trying to do life. So thank you all for all that you do, and God bless you all. Thank you, thank Sharon. You. Thank you very much. <coughs> Can I just say one other thing? Yes, ma'am. I just want to also let people know that it's, it's, it's 56 units. This is just the beginning. This is just the first phase of it. And so Sharon is working hard on actually doing more phases to all the housing authorities in the future. So that's a great thing. And when we talk about Ridgecrest, and it came up in 1971, I want everybody to know that my family was the fourth family in Ridgecrest in 1971. So I am so grateful. And it's been long overdue. Thank you, Thanks. Connie. Thank you for sharing that. All right, anyone else? All right, we've got a motion and a second. I think I know how this is going to go. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? And the motion carries. Congratulations, Ms. Tarkin. You're welcome. Mayor, those are all the items of business we have on the agenda this evening. Okay. At this time, we'll open the Citizens Open Forum. If you'd like to address the City Council about anything, uh, we ask that you please come forward and give us your name and address for the record, and you'll have three minutes uh, to talk to the City Council. Please make all your comments addressed to the City Council. My name is Robert Wilkins, 261 Denson Drive, Auburn, Alabama. Um, I have a speech here. Uh, I'm not going to give it. 
Uh, I'm, I'm so proud of the uh, council and the mayor uh, concerning the affordable housing. I'm so glad. I've always wondered why houses had to all look alike. Why in the world was that ever done? Uh, I don't know if the, when the Johnson administration began uh, those things, I, I, I'm not sure, but uh, I'm proud of each one of you. I uh, say a lot of things to each one of you. I do have a speech here that would, uh, <laughs> would not be as uh, uh, pleasing, but uh, y'all deserve good credit when it's, uh, it's there. And I hope that uh, many of you um, make sure that there are a lot more of these uh, developments. The idea of going through and seeing that. I, I live three blocks away uh, from uh, housing there on Old, uh, Old Mill Road, I believe it is. And uh, I would love to see that uh, place also done that way. And uh, I'm, I'm uh, thoroughly uh, impressed, even with you, Megan. Uh, <laughs> and I don't mean that to be ugly. <laughs> I, just, I, I complain about uh, many things with you, Megan, and, and the mayor. And sometimes there's, there's a good time, there's a bad time. And uh, I think this is just a joyous time. The last thing I'd ever want to do is, is to uh, uh, deflate uh, such a uh, uh, momentous time, I guess you'd say. Is that a good, uh, uh, what do you call it, bureaucratic way of saying it, momentous? <laughs> So uh, no, I don't mean that to be ugly. I just mean, <laughs> guys, I guess I did. So sorry about that. Um, and um, anyway, uh, y'all take care and um, keep doing a good job. Thank you. Thank you. Who will be next? Uh, I'm James Dewberry, 1259 Penny Lane, uh, Auburn, Alabama. Um, I'm here uh, with Priscilla Wyatt and Kate Witten representing the Auburn Blue FFA chapter. Uh, as you may know, uh, FFA is a national student organization committed to furthering agricultural education and opening up opportunities for um, leadership and career development for any and all students who want to uh, pursue agriculture. This week is National FFA Week and to kick it off we're starting a seed drive. The seed drive is for a kind of seed library um, at the public library where people can come and take seeds for their gardens and then return any extra seeds they have. Um, right now we're accepting any donations. Students can donate in Mr. Stevens or Ms. Falk's room at Auburn High School. And parents can come to the front office and we have a little box right when you walk in where you can uh, submit any seeds for this drive. Uh, we'd like to thank the City of Auburn and Auburn Public Library because without you this would not be possible. And we're excited to see um, all the gardeners across Auburn be connected and students and young people be able to pursue any opportunities in agriculture. So, thank you for Good. having me. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you for your hard work. James, quick question. Yes, if you're in the community and you want to donate seeds and you're not connected to Auburn High, where should they take those seeds? Um, I'm uh, confident you can walk into the front office at Auburn High School. Um, if not, um, you can wait until the library actually opens and then there'll be opportunities there. Okay, so they could drop them off at the public library um, yes, until the seed library is completed. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, James. Good job. <laughs> Who'll be next? Oh, we got one in the back. Yes, ma'am. Martha Shamp, 307 Camellia Drive. I would like to speak about AIDS, a public health crisis. The cost of HIV treatment and the medication is antiretroviral therapy with frequent visits to your doctor. Costs run anywhere between $1,800 to $4,500 each month for the rest of your life. Sometimes HIV can become resistant to more common drugs. Then your doctor will need to prescribe something stronger but more costly. The drug Trogarzo, which you can take as a shot, not a pill, that is $9,000 a month for the rest of your life. This is a medical article reviewed by Dr. Barry Zingman, September 2022. Stage one, acute HIV infection. Symptoms are swollen lymph nodes, headache, sore throat, fever, rash, muscle and joint aches, upset stomach, sores in the mouth. Stage two, chronic HIV infection. This stage lasts approximately 10 to 15 years in most people who don't take HIV treatment. The symptoms are fatigue, loose stools or diarrhea, weight loss, <coughs> episodes of shingles infection, or bouts of pneumonia, and other horrible 
things I can't tell you. HIV continues then to rep rep replicate in the body and it is possible to infect others so that they can pay $1,800 to $4,500 a month for the rest of their life to shore up in a hopeless effort their health. Stage three is full-blown AIDS. It ends in the chronic stage. HIV levels <clears throat> rise dramatically and the virus destroys the white blood cells. Certain infections or types of cancer develop. The body is unprotected against every sort of infection. Pneumocystic pneumonia causes chest pain, trouble breathing, and fatigue. Cytomegalovirus can affect their eyes, causing blindness, or attack, attack their lungs, heart, intestines, or brain. Gays, lesbians, and bisexuals have three to four times as many partners as heterosexuals, thus compounding their risk. And this is the lifestyle that the library is encouraging. Who will be next? Carrie Hill, 1199 North Star Court. Um, I wanted to check out a copy of My Shadow is Purple so that I could read some of it tonight. But it's so popular at our library that I'm on a wait list. So I decided that a book review would have to do. Ifoma Indigeth writes, My Shadow is Purple by Scott Stewart tells a powerful story of being who you are and inclusivity. In a deviation from traditional gender norms of associating blue with masculinity and pink with femininity, the child's shadow is purple, symbolizing gender fluidity. The child participates in activities for both genders without feeling the need to conform to societal expectations. They are a ballerina and play football. The child loves glitter and trains. In a particular situation, the child is faced with a difficult decision. They're asked to go against their truth, despite their unique circumstance of embracing all identities. This is a challenging situation, but the child remains true to themselves, and then the room becomes more inclusive and welcoming to everyone. Instead, the room is changed to accommodate them, and, a, and it is a group effort with everyone playing a role in bringing about acceptance and understanding of others. Had the children or the teacher not been open to diversity and inclusivity, the room would have remained the same as it had always been." End quote. Next Benedict was born on January 11, 2008. They grew up in Owasso, Oklahoma, where they were a sophomore at Owasso High School. Next identified as non-binary and used they, them pronouns. Next loved nature. They enjoyed all cats, but they especially loved their cat Zeus. They drew, they read, they cooked, they played Minecraft, and last week they died after being beaten to death by their classmates in the school bathroom. When people are given a public platform to call others perverse and depraved, it matters. When people yell about others being filthy and immoral because of an aspect of who they understand themselves to be, it matters. And when leaders say nothing in response, or when they agree that anti-trans, anti-lesbian, anti-gay, anti-bi, or any anti-queer rhetoric has any place in civic forums, it matters. On February 7th, next Benedict was dropped off at high school. On February 15th, they were placed in their grave. If we want to protect children in our community, we need more books like My Shadow is Purple, not fewer. Thank you. Who'll be next? Jeff Walker, 2078 Autumn Ridge Way. Over the last year, several of us have had to stand by and listen as employees of the library and members of this community have been needlessly called out and attacked. To all of you in this room or listening at home that have felt this, I'm sorry you've had to go through this, and I want you to let you know that you continue to have support in this community. Some of you on this council may have heard these arguments. You may agree with them. Or you may be just tired of it and want it to go away. I want to caution you on thinking in that direction as making this go away removes freedom of choice from all parents in this community. The antagonist would have you believe that they and certain special interest groups know what best 
type of content should be available in literature for checking out in our library. That these groups know better or are more responsible than the parents who visit our incredible library. The antagonist would have you believe that their opinion on this matter is righteous and all this content should be banned. Continuing this line of thought, any such ban removes the choice of individuals in this community as to what type of literature they would like to consume or what type of literature a parent might deem appropriate for their children. Our state believes so much in the parents' right to choose things for their kids that in the last legislative session, they proposed a law known as HB6, which passed and was signed by the governor to prevent just this type of disruption for parents. We have the privilege to live in a diverse community here in Auburn, filled with different cultures, beliefs, and social standards. We need to continue to support and grow that diversity by understanding that the needs of few antagonist or special interest groups do not always represent the whole and good for our community. We need to celebrate our differences, even those we don't necessarily agree with. I, for one, would not like to have my freedom of choice, what is made available to my kids, removed or revoked by special, special interest or an antagonist who has called members of my family and myself horrible things from this podium. Thank you. Who'll be next? <coughs> Hi, Council. My name is Leah Billy Welburn V, uh, 112 North DeBart 11, apartment five. Um, don't have any prepared remarks, but uh, came in time to hear some of the earlier sharing and wanted to you know, come share my thoughts with y'all. Um, I recently um, brushed up on something called the uh, pyramid of violence. And the concept of it is that low level uh, violence such as uh, violent, or sorry, not violent, but uh, discriminatory, hateful, bigoted, et cetera, um, feelings and thoughts are what compromise the base of the pyramid. They're the thing that happens most frequently uh, and they're low harm as things go. Next level up is words, um, then there's actions and violent actions up higher. So the concept behind it is that um, interrupting um, violence, bigotry, et cetera, at any severity disrupts the whole system. And so I, um, I'm happy to hear people um, <coughs> speaking up for um, this mic not being used to perpetuate and allow violence and advocating for interrupting that because it keeps people safe at all levels. Um, mm -hmm. Had some other thoughts before I got up, but you know, public speaking anxiety. Uh, Give it a couple seconds, see if it comes back. Um, oh, uh, something I did want to um, applaud y'all on is I was listening in on YouTube how we've got the um, housing uh, approval done. That's really special, and I'm I'm so glad to know that um, you know the city's been doing good work on that front. Um, it made me want to circle back to an inquiry from a few years past about the uh, recent funding under the uh, COVID relief for uh, homelessness um, and shelters. So um, hopefully I'll get in touch with one of y'all and uh, ask where that ended up leading. Um, and then one last thing, I, I want to applaud the whole staff, the council, and uh, the library staff especially for not um, taking opinions as fact. There are claims made about children's safety, which I know is a very sensitive issue, um, but there's been no evidence that children are harmed <coughs> by material that represents my community. So I appreciate that you've kept things evidence-based on that front. Thanks. Thank you. Who would be next? Close citizens open forum. Anything else from the council? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Please.
the individual before us who speaks regularly about books that she doesn't like being part of the Auburn Public Library collection knows well that the Auburn City Council has no purview over library policies. She's aware of the mechanism in place that the Auburn Public Library, not City Council, should a citizen wish to question materials selected for inclusion into the library collection. She's also aware of the care taken by library staff to ensure that children, together with their parents, have positive experiences at the library and that they enjoy age-appropriate materials. The Auburn City Council Citizens Open Forum agenda item affords this individual a platform upon which she regularly attempts to publicly disparage the LGBTQ plus community, a community made up of our friends, of our neighbours, of our colleagues, of our family members, and of our fellow taxpayers. Her words do not reflect the mission or vision of this city's administration. <clears throat> My family and I are avid readers and we're stalwart fans of our local libraries. My wife is an author <clears throat> and she's a third generation librarian. When we encounter a book in our library which doesn't work for us, like most reasonable people here, we simply return it to the shelf for an interested reader to discover and we move on. It's also important to note that the children's section of the library is currently as busy as it has ever been with parents and children enjoying the collection with zero complaints, with zero complaints. I'm proud of our Auburn librarians and the employees of the Auburn Public Library and of librarians nationwide. Their public service is rooted in empathy, diversity, openness, and especially community. For many in our city, the public library is an essential service providing access to information and resources, access to computer connectivity, literacy support, lifelong learning, and it serves as a gathering place for a wide variety of groups. I believe our librarians curate the library collection studiously and responsibly, and I trust the decisions and choices they make. And as such, many of us in the community get to see our lived experience reflected in the richly diverse titles available, including the LGBT plus community. And for that, I'm deeply grateful. They even have books on kangaroos. I encourage every citizen to go to the Auburn Public Library and to see for themselves what an outstanding, inclusive city service looks like. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, is there a move to adjourn? So moved. We're adjourned.